Well, wonderful friends, all of you, we have come on this first weekend in November uh, to the day we set aside in our congregation every year uh, to celebrate the Festival of All Saints. It's a time uh, when we pause and name publicly and pray uh, in remembrance of all those from our church family who departed this life uh, during the year past since All Saints of 2022. We call it All Saints, I guess, because it's a little bit different from the normal saint days when you usually focus on one apostle or another evangelist in particular. We're thinking of all of those uh, who clung to Christ in life and death and are now with him in glory. And we have the custom of hanging our church in white pyramids for this weekend. That's the festival color that we often get off out on Christmas and Easter, but we do it at this time because it reminds us of the bright glory uh, before God in heaven. Uh, I'm very glad to welcome all of you uh, and pray uh, that he will bring blessing to you through this online service today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you knit together your faithful people of all times and places into one holy communion, the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant us so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that together with them we may come to the unspeakable joys you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first reading for this, which is the festival of all saints, is recorded in the Revelation to St. John, chapter 7. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew in the fifth chapter. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now in the words of the Nicene Creed, we confess our holy faith together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. 
and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end and I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified who spoke by the prophets and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
May God give to every one of you people much grace and peace in the knowledge of him and of his son Christ Jesus the Lord. We're going to focus on just the first four verses of the gospel that was read before from St. Matthew in the fifth chapter and I want to repeat those four verses briefly now. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain and when he sat down his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now let's pray. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Cause your face to shine upon us that we may be saved. Amen. In Christ the Lord, my beloved sisters and brothers, all of you, all the way back to 360 AD, I'm told, Christians celebrated a festival to honor martyrs who had lost their lives because of their faith. And then later, on the 1st of November, that date was set aside, not just to think of martyrs alone, but to remember all saints. In other words, all those people who had died confessing faith in Christ. I guess that's one of the reasons that we observe this custom in our church family on the first Sunday in November every year, which is, to publicly name and remember those from our own fellowship who have departed this life ever since All Saints Sunday of 2022. We do not do this just to commemorate those people alone. We are here also to remember the faithful departed who may have been part of your families, but who may have left you a lot longer ago. Grief and loss are like that, you know. They can still sting and ache even years after the death of somebody that you loved. It is a healthy and a blessed thing not to write off those faithful departed people and just easily forget them. It's a blessed thing to remember Jesus' way with them and the solemn pledges that he makes toward you who miss them. Because you see, what he offers are not just condolences. He goes beyond mere sympathy. So, seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain. That's how today's gospel begins. Jesus had been working among great throngs of people, carrying out a very effective healing ministry. And the result was that people pressed in on him with their sick and afflicted ones from every direction. They followed him all over the place. So the Bible reports that every once in a while, Jesus sought quieter times to be separated from them, separated from the push and the press and the noise and all of the demands. And you know, Jesus also brings about many times a separation among people. I guess people who were just kind of loosely tied to him in those days stayed home or just carried about their business. But up on this mountain, apart from the crowds, when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Sitting down was Jesus' way of signaling that he was ready to speak. Teachers of the faith often did that kind of thing in synagogues and other places in those days. The faithful Christian church remembering its blessed dead, as well as individual believers who still struggle with grief and loss, and maybe you're one of those people listening to me now. We do well on this All Saints Festival to come away with Jesus and to block out the push and press and noise and demands surrounding us and deeply give an ear to his teaching. Those of you who have lost a loved one know how it goes when people express sympathy. They do it in vastly different ways, don't they? And to be quite frank about it, some of them are better at it than others. Some repeat just very customary words that can almost sound like a cliche because they just don't know what else to say. And some will actually express sympathy, but just once, almost as if it's a duty, you know, to be gotten out of the way. And then don't bother ever bringing up the subject again, almost as if you're all over it by the next time they meet you. Some talk about your dead loved one being in a better place, 
but maybe such strangers to the Bible that they don't really know where that place is nor how to get there. And some can't think of anything to say. And so they wrap their arms around you or they kiss you on the cheek or tell you how they're so sorry. Don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not criticizing them because most of those people very sincerely do mean well. But the truth is that many of them can hardly do more than speak words that change nothing. And to be fair to them, if I were left just to my own words, that's about all I could do, speak words that change nothing. Jesus does more. He offers an incomparable treasure here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who are these poor in spirit types that he's talking about anyway? They're not necessarily poor when it comes to things like bank accounts and houses and possessions. In point of fact, the poor in spirit can live in very upscale Canadian neighborhoods in a home that's been paid for a long time already. Poor in spirit people are the ones who know that when it comes to life and death and God and eternity, they've got nothing but empty pockets. Poor in spirit people have faced the fact that they're destitute and lacking and that they need help from somebody else because they're never going to be able to cure this kind of poverty on their own. They're the sort of people who gather among other things in a place like this at the start of a Holy Communion service and in an old confessional prayer call themselves poor, poor miserable sinners in relation to God. Folks whose names we read and whom we remember this weekend in our All Saints celebration called themselves exactly that, and not just once, but time and again, whenever they came and took part in those kinds of services with us. Even the well-dressed ones who drove really nice cars and had great jobs called themselves poor. Even the ones who had belonged for years to the church and were active parishioners and who over the years laid an awful lot of money down on the Lord's altar called themselves poor. These are the kind of people that God knows how to work with. This is the one to whom I will look, the Lord said through Isaiah. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. And Jesus says something that reminds me of Isaiah's little saying there. He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And so I also came not to call the righteous, but sinners. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, says Jesus. And then he tells what makes them so blessed. It's not just that they're inwardly poor or humble or needy or miserable or spiritually sick or lacking so that God finds them lying there helpless in the dust. No. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. By the way, you don't have to wait until you're dead to have the kingdom of heaven in your personal possession. It's there for people like you right now who come to God knowing how needy you are and clinging in true faith to Jesus Christ, who knows very well how to work with sinners and the poor in spirit. The apostle once put it this way. He said, our citizenship is in heaven. Those of you who have Canadian citizenship know what that's supposed to mean. That means you've got a rightful place here, even if you're far away from Canada, as I was far away a few weekends ago on a very brief trip to Germany. Those of you who treasure citizenship in our country, or in another country for that matter, will be very careful when you're away not to say anything or do anything that's going to block your way home. When you have citizenship in heaven, by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, even though you and I are not in heaven and might still be lingering in this world for a while yet, you recognize where your true home is and are determined also not to do anything or say anything that's going to block your way into that home. The blessed dead from our church family or from your families or from your circle of friends who left this world clinging to Jesus because they recognized 
how poverty stricken they are without him. They rejoice in that treasure that he gives when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's a bright place heaven is, a glad place, a place that reverberates with songs and praises to the Lamb who was slain, as we heard just a few minutes ago in that first Bible reading earlier in this service. So your blessed dead, who left this world with faith in Christ, are eternally safe in their joy, period. And even though you sorely miss them, and probably still get weepy every once in a while when you think about things they said or did, and even if they've been gone for quite a long time already, the God revealed truth that they are safe and happy in their true home ought to nudge you and me to be happy for them too. And even if we laid their bodies to rest at a very ripe old age, or in painful disease, or after some crippling weakness, even if their minds seemed totally gone, and so much of what they had been seemed faded and kind of pathetic, these bodies of theirs are going to be raised to life. Their bodies are going to be made new in the resurrection of all flesh. That's exactly what the Lord of Easter, who came out of his tomb alive and well and made new promises. He says, as I live, you shall live also. Dear ones, it's good for us to think of them. And I don't mean to think just of how wonderful they were during their lives in this world so you focus only on how much you lost when they died. It does us good to come away from the push and the press and the noise and the demands of life to come away and be with Jesus up on the mountain, if I could put it like that, and to remember the joy they have now. And it's not as though Jesus only points to promises that he has made to these blessed Christian dead. Here, at the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount, he also makes promises to you who are left behind and still grieve their loss. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, he says. You know, Jesus spoke very frankly to his followers back in the day to let them know that people who follow him are going to end up with plenty of reasons to mourn. After all, Christians in the early time, the days of the apostles, got unjustly accused of all things they didn't do, and got mistreated, and shunned, and martyred in some cases. And those things, and yes, that does include martyrdom, are happening in some parts of our world today. And some of the blessed dead that we remember this Sunday, they had their own personal set of reasons to mourn when they were still lived. Sickness hit some of those people very hard, didn't it? Some of them had to endure the tragic loss of their own relatives, in a few cases I'm aware of when those relatives were quite young. Or they endured pain because they had to watch some of their own family members drift from Christ and even leave the faith. They had their own reasons to mourn. You who listen to me now still mourn over them in many cases, even if the funeral was a long time ago and on the surface it looks like everything must have gotten back to normal by now. All it takes is at home to run across a picture or to find a little note, you know, stuck away in a book scribbled in their trademark handwriting, or to recall how Christmases were with them when the whole family was still together in their heyday. And there it is, out of the blue, grief and mourning, spilling out all over you again. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, said Jesus. I want you to understand something about comfort, the way the Bible talks about it. Comfort is not just a pleasant feeling. It's not just a little bit of fairy tale relief, kind of like an anesthetic, you know, that lifts you out of reality and takes all the pain away in an instant like magic or something. Comfort in the Bible's understanding means to strengthen greatly. It's God's rock-solid pledge made to you personally that he will hold you together. He'll enable you to cope He'll help you find your way. He'll stand beside you in your troubles and he's not going to leave no matter how long it might take. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. 
That's how St. Peter told it to his friends at a time of persecution that caused a great many of them to mourn. I told you how Jesus went up on a mountain, apart from the crowds and pressures, and that his disciples went away to be with him up on that mountain to draw close to him and to hear him teach. These four little verses that I've quoted today are just the start of Christ's great Sermon on the Mount. That sermon runs for three whole chapters of Matthew's Gospel book. And when Jesus got to the end of that sermon, you know what Matthew said about the whole thing? He says, People were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority. That's what Jesus is doing when he promises the kingdom of heaven to anybody, including your blessed dead, and even including you, anybody who's poor in spirit. And that's what he's doing when he, by his word, pledges comfort to his mourning sons and daughters. You have what he promises because he have, has the authority to give it all, not just to talk about it, but to give it all. The authority that was signed and sealed when he died out of love for you and out of love for the blessed dead whom you have lost. And then when he was also raised from the dead by the glory of his Father. And so he speaks with authority. He offers more than mere sympathy. He offers you today himself. He's alive, my friend. He's there. And he's yours. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now let's pray. Gracious God, King of the universe, enthroned in heaven, surrounded by angels and the glad company of ransomed people, in your mercy, accept our praises this day and open your ears to the prayers we now bring before you. We praise you for the triumph you revealed to us and to your whole church, washed clean in the holy blood of your Christ. Let the knowledge of your eternal care for those who died in the faith, whom we have loved and lost, bring comfort to your children still struggling with sorrow and grief. Look upon us with pity, O Father, and fulfill your promise to keep us strong to the end. Hasten the day when we may take our place, lay hold of our palm branches, and shout out our love for you forever. By your word and spirit, strengthen your believing sons and daughters with the pressures they meet in life. Hold us close to the sound of your voice as it comes through your word. Use it to kindle sincere repentance and faith inside us. Gather us constantly around your holy table. Feed us there with the body and blood of Christ. And open our eyes to the ways you would use each of us to preserve others in the faith. Bring healing to our world in its troubles and conflicts. Help the hungry to find food. Stop the killing and destruction in Ukraine, in the Middle East, and in other war-torn lands. Let workplaces flourish with honesty and fairness between management and employees. Bless those staffing our institutions of health care. Bind husbands and wives, parents and children more closely together. Enrich nations like this. Pull us away from living selfishly for things and pastimes and draw us time and again back to Christ who holds all things together. Lord of all saints and believers, both those still struggling in the world and those before you in triumph and rest, we give you our praise and worship, our thanksgiving and love, in the name of your Lamb, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.